How does your brain know where to store a new idea, a word, or a relationship? Today I'll show you a working neural circuit that solves this exact problem quickly, efficiently, and using biologically realistic neurons. This isn't theory, it's a practical, testable mechanism that brings us one step closer to understanding how a real intelligence works in your brain. I'm Charles Simon, longtime AI researcher, software developer, and manager. Beyond AI, I've developed software for neurological test instruments and neural simulators. I created the Future AI Society to explore how neuroscience can inform smarter, more human-like AI. And I'm using our open source brain simulator projects for simulations and demonstrations throughout this video series. If you want to experiment on your own, you can download the Brain Simulator 2 from GitHub and try out these neural circuits and suggest improvements. In this video, we're diving into a question that's simple to ask, but surprisingly hard to answer. How does the brain decide where to store information when it encounters something new? This might sound abstract, but it's a problem your brain solves every time you see something new, hear a sound you've never heard before, or form a new memory. And while many AI approaches like backpropagation, predictive coding, the thousand brains theory, or even large language models give grand explanations, they don't explain how these processes could actually work in biological neurons. When I try to simulate those systems at the level of real neural circuits, the wheels fall off. They're either too vague or simply too slow to be plausible. As an example, artificial neural networks start by initializing all synapse weights to small randomized values, which simply randomizes which information gets stored where. In a biological realm, Minute differences in synapse weights are completely invisible to neurons, so this approach simply doesn't work. So today I'll show you a working biologically inspired neural circuit, one that demonstrates how the brain might solve this problem using real spikes, real timing, and real neurons and synapses. Let's start with the challenge. Imagine your brain is confronted with a brand new stimulus. To learn it, the brain has to allocate some part of its cortex to handle the information. Your neocortex has millions of cortical columns, but how does your brain decide which one to use to store this particular information? It can't overwrite what it already knows, and it has to pick just one place to assign the new data. That means find an available cortical column and do it quickly, reliably, and without chaos. This is like memory allocation in a computer, but in the brain there's no central controller to do this. The neurons have to figure it out themselves. In the simulation I'll show you, we build a model with five cortical columns. Each one has eight neurons. Bear in mind that a complete biological column has closer to a hundred, so we still have plenty of neurons left to perform other necessary functions. The key to making this work is something I call the in-use synapse that keeps track of whether a column is already busy. If this synapse has a weight near zero, the column is available. If it is near one, the column is in use. Let's simplify things for a moment and focus just on this one synapse, which will strengthen or weaken depending on the timing relationship of spikes arriving at either end. We introduce the activate neuron. It fires a burst of four spikes. Thanks to well-timed connections at both ends of the synapse, those spikes apply heavy and learning rules to set the weight to one, marking the column as in use. You may remember the Hebbian rule, if the presynaptic spike comes before the postsynaptic, the synapse is strengthened. If it comes after, it's weakened. The rule gives us a biologically realistic way to turn our columns on and off. 
But activating a column isn't enough. If the brain could only ever use a column once, it would run out of capacity pretty quickly. That's why we also need a deactivate circuit, a way to reset the in-use synapse and make a column available again. This is how the brain can forget. It's also how we recycle neural resources for new information. I'll go into more detail on that mechanism in future videos. But for now, just know that deactivation is just as essential as activation. Let's manually fire the activate neuron. See the burst of four spikes with signals going to both ends of our in use synapse? The neuron to the right of our activate neuron provides the necessary delay so the spike arrives at the lower synaptic neuron slightly later and the synapse weight will increase. When the burst is complete, the synapse value will be 1. We can reverse the process with the deactivate neuron. If you look closely at the two neurons on either end of the NU synapse, you'll see them fire with the lower postsynaptic neuron firing first this time. This is the reverse of the timing for the activate process. And a burst like this will reduce the synapse weight to near zero. Now back to the big question. How does the brain choose which available column to use? Here's how this circuit works. When the request signal comes in, imagine it comes from the hippocampus, it has to activate the first available column and suppress all the others. This happens through a clever combination of timing and inhibition. First, the request signal is routed so that all columns receive it at the same time. Then each column checks its own in-use synapse. If the synapse says the column is already in use, the signal gets blocked by an inhibitory synapse, shown in black in this simulation. If the column is available, the signal propagates onward, and here's the clever part. Once that happens, the column immediately triggers a suppressive cascade, inhibitory synapses that block other columns from activating. That way, only the first available column is activated, even if several are technically free. It's fast, efficient, and biologically plausible. Once a column is chosen, its activate neuron fires a burst. Again, four spikes. This burst marks the column as in use and also potentially triggers other processes to prepare that column for learning. In future videos, I'll show how this activation burst connects to the learning circuitry and how the column actually acquires meaning. It would be simple to add a few neurons to fire if there are no available columns to use. We could imagine that this could trigger a forgetting process, but for this demonstration, I'll just manually deactivate a few columns so you can see how the circuit automatically fills in to the first available column. This implementation chooses the first available column based on position, but the real brain probably uses more sophisticated strategies too. These alternatives would require a few extra synapses to calculate a score with the highest scoring column winning. That's not part of today's simulation, but it's well within the scope of biologically inspired design. Here's what makes this system really amazing. The whole process takes just five milliseconds, and it doesn't matter how many columns are in play, five, 10, a thousand. The system still picks the right one in the same amount of time. Why? Because it's parallel. All columns receive the request at the same time, and the selection process is handled locally through fast synaptic interactions. No loops, no serial scanning. This is one of the brain's biggest advantages over traditional computers. Biological neural systems aren't just powerful, they're fast because they do everything at once. 
This simulation reflects real neuroscience. It shows sparse coding where only one column out of many fires. It uses lateral inhibition, just like the olfactory bulb or the visual cortex. It's built on Hebbian plasticity, which has decades of experimental support, and it reflects the columnar organization, which has been documented since the 1950s. And unlike many AI theories, this one doesn't wave its hands. It's a real testable spike-based circuit that you can simulate, measure, and evolve. Of course, column selection is just the beginning. There are bigger questions to answer. How does the selected column learn? How can columns be reused? How do different sensory modalities like vision and hearing coordinate? And how is information retrieved later? We'll explore these topics in future simulations. So to wrap up, this circuit shows that even a simple function like selecting a neural column can be done in a biologically plausible way using real spikes, real timing, and real learning rules. This bottom-up approach, building cognition from the ground up, may be our best path forward toward more human-like AI. Not abstract algorithms, not magic black boxes, but circuits that do real work. In the next video, we'll look at how these columns can learn information and we'll run into a whole new set of challenges with the Hebbian rule. If these ideas resonate with you, if you want to see where they lead, please like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell because the YouTube algorithm won't surface videos like these unless you ask for them. And if you want to dig deeper, join the Future AI Society it's free and help us shape the next generation of intelligent systems and you can participate in our online conversations and as always thanks for watching